Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With us today, we have Daniel McAdams, our co-host. Daniel, good to see you. Good morning, Dr. Paul. How are you this morning? Doing well, doing good. well. Up to our old uh, <coughs> job that we have. That's Stop right. a war, end a war, prevent a war. Anything. We're not doing so well. <laughs> I understand war's been around for a long time, but that's not an excuse. You shouldn't keep, you shouldn't give up just because of the history, it doesn't look very good <laughs> for getting rid of all the wars. But there can be times when countries have gone along together and, and managed to live together. And all I know is the less big <coughs> government we have and international government and entangling alliances, the more likely it is the people will figure out how to live with each other. Yes. But we, unfortunately, we have a lot of that entanglement that we have to deal with. And right now, the one we're going to talk about to start off with is uh, it comes from an article on anti-war talking about more troops to the Middle East. Wow, I wonder what's going on here. Don't, don't we just use a proxy over there and they do all our fighting? <coughs> is this a shift? This is no longer just a proxy war, yeah. somebody fighting our battles. But the U.S. sending more troops to the Middle East after Israel's escalation uh, in, in Lebanon. But, you know, one thing that I came across, more troops, I thought, well, we probably don't have that many there. But on this report, they said, uh, I, I'm not going to comment or provide specifics, he said. That's Ryder, uh, 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 Pentagon spokesman, on, on this. He said... There are currently about 40,000 wow. U.S. military personnel across the Middle East. And, uh, it, and you know, that's probably not common in the Navy and Air Force yeah. that's uh, surrounding the area and involved. So th this is a mess, and now we're sending it. Of course, the battle has been going on. We've talked about the escalation and... Uh, there was one statement, uh, you, may, you may have already picked this out, but I want to make it a, one of the things, Secretary Austin expressed his support for what, to justify all this stuff. Israel's right to defend itself. Yeah. Certainly they have a right to defend itself. Yes. But that doesn't mean you have a right to do anything you want anytime and, and use, uh, use, pro, use our money and our troops now uh, and, and uh, attack for, for the purpose of attacking and deeper into Israel. Uh, well, you know, on and on. So what we have been talking about for months, if not years, uh, this looks like another significant step, uh, especially the discovery that the troops have been pouring in, and now we're going to send more, and uh, one thing leads to another, and it looks like, looks like that war is expanding. It hasn't decreased uh, as of now that we can tell. The question is, what is their mission? And that's something that hasn't been answered. It's somehow to show support for Israel as Israel attacks yet another foreign country. Um, but the question, I mean, if I were in Congress, thank goodness I'm not, I would demand some answers. What is their mission? You, Mr. President, are sending U.S. troops into a combat zone. After, remember, Kamala said, we don't have any troops in a combat zone. They're sending them into a combat zone. What is their mission? What are they allowed to do? Uh, you know, what, what, are they, what are they supposed to do? And I think Americans looking at this and looking at the war, which has escalated uh, significantly, the Israelis killed about 500, more than 500 Lebanese in one single day. So that's a big escalation in the war. Americans should be wondering, what happens if these things goes uh, even more south? What if, Israel, uh, what if Iran gets involved? Um, this could expand very much, and you could be looking at things like a military draft. You know, we need to have a lot more people. So Americans are going to start dying uh, over there if we don't if we don't start paying attention of course that's exactly what Israel wants uh, they want us to fight this war because they know that they they've picked a fight with everyone around them kind of a dumb thing to do um, but they're gonna need us to fight it but I would I, I would just echo what you said dr. Paul uh, the problem is in DC not Tel Aviv you know the problem is that we're sending the money we're sending the weapons and what do we do and Dave DeCamp uh, makes a good point in his piece that you referenced he said throughout the past year, the U.S. has sent additional forces to the Middle East as a show of support for Israel. The strong support from the U.S., including a constant flow of weapons shipments, has emboldened Israel to escalate in Lebanon and elsewhere in the region. And he put it very well because it emboldens them. They have the sense 
that we can do whatever we want because America's got our backs. We can pick fights with whoever we want. We can bomb whoever we want because America stands behind us. And that's the opposite signal we should be sending. Well, I know you must have a tendency to, uh, ex uh, you know, uh, feel the same way as I do. It's sadness because yeah. I always look at it and say, you know, all this killing is preventable. You know, all, all we have to do is have stayed out of there. And yet the special interest, this once again, I think uh, uh, of the getting together the majority by propaganda and uh, lobbying the government and all the money and the politics of it. Uh, and they call that democracy. But it's not democracy, it's the, it's the power of the military industrial complex and money and politics and all to come in and scare the people <clears throat> to the point where if you say anything, you're unpatriotic, yeah. you know. But we should have been, we, wow, we should have even have been involved the way I look at it, back in 1948, yeah. you know, the, the whole thing is, is uh, you know, th this whole thing of NATO and, and the United Nations, wh what have they really achieved? <laughs> I keep thinking, you know, I remember the day the United, the, uh, the, uh, United States had to go to war to, uh, uh, in, in Korea. But what was the first thing they did? They got the UN to declare the war. Yeah. And, and hardly anything was said. So it, it embarked on that. And since then, of course, uh, the, we, we don't even bother. We just go and get involved. And even if you point this out, so I still think that there's, <coughs> there's a um, defect in our ability to get our message out. It's such a powerful message. It's such a good message of non-interventionism and, and following the Constitution and uh, not basing war on plunder. Uh, but, but it doesn't seem to resonate. And uh, I, 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 but I, I still think the most important thing is that we don't give up because that's the only alternative we have is to compete with this and hopefully try to avoid the knockdown not only economic battle but the knockdown big military battle back in a, to a war, world of chaos and, and more uh, more war yeah and I think the world knows that these are US f-35s and f-15s they're dropping US bombs on Lebanon and so it, how does that help our own national security. It just creates new enemies for us that are, are, that are that is not helpful at all to us economically in terms of safety, national security. But it, this is bad enough that they're sending more troops. But if you put on that uh, that next clip, the White House uh, is urging all Americans to flee Lebanon as third Israeli strike rocks Beirut. They are attacking Beirut. There are plenty of Americans there. I think there are American troops there as well. The White House is saying, everyone, get out. It's not safe there anymore. Yeah, this is wise uh, advice, and that he should, because, uh, you know, trying to save lives, and yet uh, I think what they need to do is, why are we there, what's the purpose, and, and uh, when, when are we going to achieve our goals? But uh, my, my thoughts <laughs> when I saw this, uh, it's a bit, I think it was, it's not exactly being cynical. It's that it, I felt like this is the truth. And, and uh, it says the White House urges all Americans to flee uh, as the third Israeli strikes uh, rocks from Beirut. And I thought, well, you, you know, it's like, get out of town, Americans. This is your advice before our bombs kill you. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> You know, it. it's our money, our, our bombs, and uh, it's bad policy. And, uh, and, and, and actually, and, and you'll remember very clearly that the majority of the American people were with us against going into Iraq. Yes. You, you know, and, and they spent, they spent a, good many months, a good many months just getting, you, you know, a, a token acceptance of all that. Not to say they ridiculed the whole idea. Well, if this is dangerous, why don't you declare wars was, was my argument. Oh, no, we don't want to do that. that that's too serious. <laughs> so. Uh, but but the whole thing is is 
it, it's uh, I, I just don't know why the people don't wake up. Uh, t it, it's it's always it's easier to go in and start and uh, propaganda hit hits put it painted like you know patriotism and uh, profits. <laughs> then all of a sudden we're engaged and then to stop it. And I keep thinking of the the terrible time that uh, I was very much aware of what was happening in the 60s of trying to get out of Vietnam. Uh, but how do we get, and then we get into places like Iraq. How do we get out of it? Sometimes we never get out. Yeah. Uh, it's surprising. We still have troops in these countries that we thought were le finally leaving. Uh, but it's, it's on and on. And uh, that's what the goal has to be is you know, uh, uh, wake the American people up to realize don't give support to this, you know, uh, be, uh, before uh, when it's leading to war. Uh, but too, too often, you know, complacency and special interests and all the things that lead to war happen. But uh, I still think there's an anti-war sentiment even under today's circumstances and uh, more people speaking out and, and at least looking at what we're talking about. Well, you really hit the nail on the head right there because this is the epitome of bad policy. Urging Americans to get out of there because American bombs are about to kill you. You know, if this is not insanity, I don't know what is. You're going to get killed by our own bombs that you already paid for, by the way, so you better get out. It's absolutely insane. Thank goodness for the no wonderful advice. Huh? Yeah, 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 exactly. So here's a couple of clips to let you know what's going on. Uh, who are we sending in? Well, we're sending in the famed, if you go to that next clip, the famed 101st Airborne Division of the U.S., which served in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, has received orders to redeploy to the Middle East. The division's advanced units have arrived in the Netherlands. Four cargo planes took off from Kentucky tonight. The U.S. administration is planning evacuation operations in Lebanon. So make no mistake about it, uh, they're sending in troops that have been in wars and they're anticipating a war. But go to the next one now. This, this is another one that really is outrageous. Following an announcement earlier from the Pentagon that additional U.S. military assets and personnel were being deployed to the Middle East, according to Axios, the United States has asked Israel to take steps to ensure the safety of American service members and nationals if it were to order a military evacuation from Lebanon. So we have to ask Israel, please do not use any of the bombs that we sent you to kill Americans who are trying to evacuate the country from the bombs you're about to drop on them. You know, that is th that's such an outrage. Um, but you have to also ask yourself, is that not a perverse incentive? Just as Zelensky, who we'll talk about in a second, is desperate to draw NATO in its, into its war with Russia, Israel, Netanyahu's government, is desperate to draw the U.S. military into its wars against the Palestinians and the Lebanese. So what kind of incentive would it be for uh, maybe some service members that get killed and make it look like Hezbollah did it? God forbid that would happen, <laughs> but Americans would be outraged. They'd be demanding more, more military action. We could find ourselves in a serious war very quickly. You know, you made a good point earlier about uh, being... Uh, our, our government being more explicit. Why are we going in and what is the purpose and when is it going to end? But uh, they don't generally do that. But Austin makes an attempt at this, which is really, uh, it comes across ra rather feeble. The Pentagon in Austin also said, make, their quote is, to make clear that the United States remains postured to protect U.S. forces, that sounds good, and personnel and determined and determined to deter any regional actors from exploiting the situation or expanding the conflict. It's, isn't that pathetic? Yeah, yeah. You know, just words, <laughs> words that mean nothing to them and just trying to pacify the masses. And yet at the same time, the people wake up and they find out that uh, this all does have an economic effect and they, they're wondering why uh, their wages don't go up and prices go up and they don't see any relationship of how the, the combination of this foreign policy and economic policy is devastating. And unfortunately, uh, my assessment is it's going to last for a while and it's going to be bad. It's going to get a lot worse, but the answer is not difficult. And when people say, well, what would you do? I said, 
we should insist that people at least read the Constitution yeah. and take their oath seriously. And that is not a perfect answer, but it's a heck of a lot better than what we're doing. Yeah. Well, the claim that Israel makes for bombing Lebanon is that they keep shooting rockets over here, so we've got to respond. We've been sitting here taking it for so long, we've got to do something. You know, we're, we're the victims here. But I found this interesting chart from the BBC, uh, hardly an anti-Israeli bias at the BBC. Now, they tracked the missiles, the cross-border attacks since the famed October of 2023 uh, attacks of last year, and the red is Israel attacking Lebanon, and the blue is Lebanon and Hezbollah attacking Israel. And from this chart, you can see overwhelmingly it is Israel that is the aggressor in shooting missiles and attacks into Lebanon. So, you know, they say, Dr. Paul, the first casualty in war is the truth. And so I think we're going to see a lot more of these kinds of uh, you know, uh, war propaganda. So if there are some people on a college campus who wants to take that and make, just make the point, just yeah. look at this. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a crime. I mean, they have to be canceled. Yeah. And, uh, and yet they're trying to express what's going on and uh, trying to seek uh, the truth of what's happening. And it, it does get messy. There's no doubt about it. But uh, I, I just think with, with sincerity, uh, is truth is not that complicated. Yeah. Well, the second thing we want to talk about t today is election interference. Now, we tend to poo-poo the idea that foreigners are interfering in our elections. You know, that is a, a scare tactic. But we happen to actually find a foreigner who is interfering in our elections. Oh. So we stand corrected. Um, let's put on that next clip. This is from the Sunday Times in the UK. None other than our favorite... Uh, T-shirt wearing fellow, Zelensky, he's in town. Zelensky to press Joe Biden for Trump-proof security guarantees. He wants Biden to give him more money, of course, more bombs, and he wants him to do it in a way, if you can put that next one on, in a way that President Trump can't undo it. So he wants to basically interfere in President Trump's constitutional authority to make foreign policy. Zelensky will call for security guarantees to prevent Ukraine being forced into an unfavorable peace deal by a future Trump administration when he visits the U.S. this week, which he's here now. And so that's what he's pushing for. Um, uh, it's, it's pretty outrageous. Oh, it is outrageous. And uh, it's, it, the sad part is it's acceptable. Yeah. I mean, and I've said this so many times because it really bothers me. If you bring a guy like this to, to our country, that's not... That's not the worst thing to do if they want to communicate. Yeah. Uh, but when the goal is to, uh, you know, plunder the American people, the American taxpayer, and get people to support it and drum up all these lies and innuendos, and that that is where the, the real problem is. And then honor them with the whole idea of giving major speeches on the House floor. Yeah. You know, it, it just is a... Just another indication that uh, you you know you know they worry and talk a bit about national sovereignty and protecting borders. Yet we invite people in that uh, are hardly uh, there to defend the principles of the Constitution and freedom. They're here to get money and advance the war, and the warmongers join in because that, that's what we like. We make more money doing yeah, this. Yeah. Well, he's, they're terrified that Trump will be elected. And, and Trump is hardly an non-interventionist. That's been, it was our complaint when he was president. He's hardly an non-interventionist. But they're terrified of him becoming president. It's not just Zelensky, but the entire military-industrial complex. The entire war machine, the deep state, uh, is, is terrified of him. And here's a clip, and here's what terrifies them, because he has a way of resonating with the American people, the folly of our foreign policy. Put on that uh, video clip. You might want to grab your... Your ear uh, piece, Dr. Paul. And this is, I think this is Trump yesterday talking about the Zelensky circus coming to town. And this is what, I mean, before you start it, you know, we can, we can be up here explaining foreign policy until our, you know, our ears turn blue. But somehow Trump was able to go up there and make a joke. It's probably more successful, to be honest. But let's, let's put them in and listen to what Trump says. Ukraine now, I see Zelensky is here. I think Zelensky is the greatest salesman in history. 
Every time he comes into the country, he walks away with $60 billion. <laughs> billion. Walks in with $60 billion. He wants them to, he wants them to win this election so badly. But I would do differently. I will work out peace before I'm even before. As president-elect, if I win this election, the first thing I'm going to do is call up Zelensky and call up President Putin, and I'm going to say, you got to make a deal. This is crazy. <laughs> Can't complain about yeah, that, that one. That resonates. And that interesting, you hear the boos among those. Look like they were blue-collar workers when he's mentioned that, that name. So it's very... <laughs> Very interesting, but now here's a couple of clips on Twitter uh, X that I brought up because we talk about election interference and several other people have noticed this. So he was touring a bomb factory yesterday, Zelensky was, in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Put on this next clip, now this is uh, uh, Greg, uh, go to the next one, actually. Uh, go forward, yeah, I'm gonna skip that one, go forward. And here we go, so this is Greg Price, he's a conservative commentator. Uh, he makes a very good point, he shows uh, Zelensky touring this Mil this arms factory, Zelensky is now touring ammunition factories in Pennsylvania and attacking President Trump and J.D. Vance in American media outlets. And here's what this is the point I outlined. A foreign leader is essentially campaigning for Harris on American soil. <coughs> and if you go to the next one, here's Zelensky in the New Yorker attacking J.D. Vance. Uh, the question is, apart from Trump's own reluctance to talk about Ukrainian victory, he has chosen J.D. Vance as his vice president. Zelensky says, he's too radical. And then the question, Vance has become a, with a more precise plan to, Zelensky says, give up our territories. And he goes on and on to criticize. And Glenn Greenwald makes an excellent point. If you go to the next one, Dr. Paul, when you want to talk about interference, of course, he always is able to spit out a great uh, little line here. What uh, Greenwald says, Democrats spent eight years whining about foreign interference in our sacred elections. Now they're campaigning with Ukraine's president for life in key <laughs> swing states. Recall that Ukrainians also worked with the DNC to help elect Hillary. And here's Zelensky getting off of a C-17 U.S. military aircraft, landing in Pennsylvania, a key swing state, uh, and essentially campaigning. And just one more on that same note, if you go to the next one, um, oh, this is more on interference. Go to that next clip. Now this is the governor of Pennsylvania, a Democrat, and they say, it says, Democrats impeached Trump for a phone call with Zelensky. Now they are autographing ammunition alongside Zelensky on U.S. soil, to which I would add, uh, re reiterate what Glenn said, a swing state, a key swing state. Yes, you know, he, 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 his declared purpose of being here is to reveal his victory plan. Yeah. <laughs> he, he has this plan, and <laughs> one thing here is, uh, Zelensky said he, when, when he was being quizzed a little bit, Zelensky said he would not reveal full details of the plan until he met with Biden. Yeah. So, so he wasn't ready to talk about it in public, and, uh, but but the, but the, the the statement there of why is he here? Is it, why is he you know, why does he have this much credibility? And why is it costing us so much? Why does it lead to more killing and not peace? But uh, if, if the if the peace plan doesn't satisfy his plan, yeah, and, and then he couches it sometimes in two that that he really wants uh, he really wants to talk to Russia, yeah, yeah. on his term, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Well. I guess we'll, we'll close out now. Uh, I do want to thank Conrail 2020 for uh, doing a live chat with $10. And he points out that Trump's plan was written by Fred Flights, who is a terrible neocon. So again, not perfect, but at least it's making them nervous. Um, but I'm going to close out, Dr. Paul, with an announcement of my own. If you put on that last clip, uh, I just decided yesterday I will be going to the Rage Against the War Machine rally on the 28th in Washington, D.C., at the Washington Monument. Uh, you know, Dr. Paul, you, you're a big uh, supporter of people getting out and letting it be known that they oppose war and people that can often feel helpless. What can I do? Well, what we can do is go there, <coughs> have a big presence of people there saying, no, we don't want these wars. So I hope as many people as possible will go out there 
uh, and, uh, and show some support for the cause of peace. It's going to be a, a great rally. We were there together last time a couple years ago, so I'm really glad they're holding it again. Very good. Glad you're getting there. Let them have it. <laughs> Don't be bashful. <laughs> I'll try not. <laughs> okay. The, uh, the, the, uh, one, one thing I want to do is, uh, is make it very clear philosophically what we're after because we're discredited very often because if you take a position of not intervention uh, overseas that you're an isolationist and that's a bad word you don't want to isolate and I would say that uh, people have a right to isolate themselves if they want to live on their property and take care of themselves and they don't bother their neighbors they they're allowed to be isolation a country could do that too but that's not the way you got, uh, people like it. They like to intermingle. They like to talk to people. They like to, you know, educate uh, different people. So the, it's out there. But the reason they do this is they, uh, the, the people want, have, to, have to destroy the principles of, non, uh, of, of uh, non-intervention because it's uh, likely to lead to peace. And sometimes they don't want peace. They certain people defending and, and, and uh, benefiting from, uh, from it profit-wise and power-wise. So uh, the isolationist uh, argument is just not true because if you believe in a free society and you allow an individual to isolate themselves from the world and they don't, he doesn't bother anybody, he doesn't use the government to plunder and take and steal from them and, uh, and to rule the world and do all these things and violate civil liberties, uh, they're, they're harmless. But if you are more inclined to what the majority of people are throughout history, is they want to be in groups and they want to work together. And the voluntary approach to that is so different than it is when you have government uh, organizing uh, this type of operation. So when people come together, you know, just think one-on-one -on -one individuals, just think of how, how great that would be if nobody did anything with another person unless both sides agreed to it. Economically, socially, religiously, all of that would be so much, so much better. And what about the countries? What if the countries never, this would be the real charge, challenge, because uh, we who had the, one of the best and the freest countries, it wasn't long before we started throwing our weight around and not waiting for the opposition to agree with us to do certain things. And right now, we certainly don't follow that. We're interventionists, and uh, the whole idea is they're trying to destroy our ideas. You're a bunch of isolationists. You, you don't want to. You don't want to join all these uh, groups like the United Nations and whatnot. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I, the uh, intervention by big government is not the answer to finding out how the best way for people to get along. If you're interested in peace and prosperity, that's where we should go. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. To the Liberty Report, please come back soon.